So this evening, the observance night, and it's, I think it's getting, uh, this is the winter solstice. So it should be uh, around this time anyway, the shortest day of the year and the longest night. So from now on the day should get longer than nights shorter. <laughs> so just to reflect on this, uh, this is the sense world that we're experiencing right now. This, the physical bodies that are sitting here, the being aware of it as a uh, you know, the feeling of sen sensations, pleasure, pain, pressure, heat and cold, or uh, whatever thoughts, memories, emotions, conditions that you're experiencing in your mind at this time, the changing, like the changing of the seasons, the day and night, the senses, the body, the realm, Everything is that we're experiencing this time is the sense, sense realm <coughs> through consciousness. So this is uh, just a reflection on the way it is. It's not a statement on uh, on a, a being good or bad or anything else. It's just a noticing, observing. No comment about whether the shortest day of the year or the longest day of the year, which is better. We might have our preferences, you know, personal preferences, but that has nothing to do with the way it is. It's just the, <coughs> the, the way it is is that at this time here, at this place, on this planet, the day is short and the nights are long. So this is like reflecting on the way it is. So Dhamma, this word Dhamma is the truth of the way it is. Being the knower of Dhamma. If we don't do this, then we're, then we're caught up into our own, you know, if we don't like winter time, uh, we don't like short days, and we don't like long nights, and we want eternal spring and sunshine and blue skies and and neither too hot nor too cold and then, then these are maybe personal preferences that we have but that's not the way it is. But if we don't reflect in this way then we tend to complain, grumble, resent things because we we don't like the cold. We, when we, if we don't like the cold then we we want something that we're not having. So this is the way the Buddha was pointing to, just a way of exploring, investigating experience within this form as a human individual. The truth of the way it is. Now, modern society, I'm from a society, cultural background where it's based on how things should be. And so it's uh, like the American uh, <coughs> culture is based on ideals of how things should be. So it's, uh, it's quite altruistic and the ideals are very uh, good. But it's, ideals are not the way things are. Ideals are created in our mind they're, you know, they can be very beautiful, but conditioned realm is not an ideal. It's like this. You have birth, and that is the cause for death, the law of karma. Birth and death are, uh, you know, if you have one, you have the other. Where well, we, we might, we like birth, but we may not, we fear death. So when babies are born, we, we think, oh, babies are beautiful, we love babies, and we, we, we're happy and we ooh and awe 
and you know carried away with our delight in the in a newborn child and then when you're an old person nobody does that anymore <laughs> so they don't think isn't the ajahn tomato cute But when I was born, I, I assumed that that's what my mother thought. But that, that's just the way it is. Uh, getting old is like this. The body is aging. Youth and health and vigor, isn't that these are beautiful uh, romance, adventure, excitement. These are the pleasures of life. So what we see, hear, smell, taste, touch, have a pleasurable, beautiful, exciting, interesting, fascinating. But, that's, but these are changing conditions. So the other side of the, of the uh, condition is that it, what, be, what is interesting will be boring eventually. Or what what, we, what fascinates us is uh, excites us is boring later on, and so as uh, meditators, we're contemplating this. And, you know, the whole aim of uh, Buddhist meditation is to be the observer, the knower of the way it is. So it's not just trying to create interesting, fascinating, inspiring mental states or pleasurable. Uh, you know, beautiful experiences that we would like to have or that we long for, but so much of our life has to be bear with the other side, with the aging process, with pain, with sickness, boredom, um, disinterest, despair, resentment, anger, and all the other, the, the, the negative side of condition phenomena. So that's why we take refuge in, in the, this traditional way of, of uh, thinking. Buddha Dhamma Sangha, this is uh, taking refuge in Buddha Dhamma Sangha, is the willingness to put yourself on that, uh, that edge between the created and the uncreated, the point of intersection of the timeless with time. You know, that's what T.S. Eliot in the quartet, he says, the point of intersection between the timeless and time. <clears throat> so mindfulness, being mindful, is that point of intersection. And that's why the Buddha uh, emphasized this, this word Mindfulness is translated sati sampachanya. Sati sampachanya is a Pali word, generally translated as mindfulness or awareness. The awakened conscious moment here and now, being awake and aware of the way it is. So it's not about cultural preferences, uh, emotional feelings, uh, ideals, or anything else, but beginning to awaken and recognize and, uh, and appreciate the human ability to be aware and awake. Now we all have that potential, all human beings have this uh, potential for enlightenment, for awakened knowing, for seeing Dhamma, for, real, uh, for being liberated from delusion. This is, this is not about personal abilities or cultural uh, attitudes or even religious ones. <clears throat> the Buddha, you know, is, a, is an ancient uh, religion. But the Buddha's teaching is, uh, you know, back in ancient India or modern Britain, is pointing at the same thing. The point of intersection between the between the timeless and time. <clears throat> so time then is the conditions that we're experiencing. Time is uh, the, the, 
Night, it's nighttime. It's uh, winter solstice. It's the seasons changing. It's uh, it's uh, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, thinking, feeling, emotions, psychic phenomena, previous life memories, past memories, memories of yesterday, uh, views and opinions, ideals. Right and wrong, good and bad, high and low, heaven and hell. All this is about time. Birth and death is about time. Time is, is, uh, is the conditioned realm. The body is about time. Your human body is a time condition. And so when we cultivate awareness, it means that we're, we're actually positioning ourselves at that point of intersection the timeless then you can't you can't describe you can only recognize or realize through through uh, paying attention the more you try to think about the timeless or the deathless or the unconditioned the more confused you become when you try to figure out what is the timeless or the unborn, uncreated, unconditioned or Nibbana or Anatta, no self or the timeless or the deathless <clears throat> you'll get your brain into a twist it'll just be, you just create more and more mental confusion because language itself, thought itself is time thinking is about time it's a condition Thinking is conditioned. So trying to think about the timeless is impossible, isn't it? That's why you end up confused. And uh, just like listening to people discussing, you know, on the BBC about God. What is the, is there, is there God or do you believe in God or there isn't any God? When you're trying to think and define that which is beyond thought and definition or the timeless or I assume that's what God really means ultimately it must be that which is unconditioned, unborn, uncreated this is just how I see it you know because the word itself uh, it tends to be bound into definitions. Uh, it's personified, anthropomorphized. So you have a, you have a, you know, God is a kind of old man, patriarchal male up in the sky, or is, is a childlike view of that. But I'm sure that behind all religion, all conventional religions, is, is the same. It's about the timeless, the deathless, the uncreated, the unborn. Which the Buddha said you cannot define or describe, but you can recognize through awareness. To be a fully aware, then you, you have, you, to be completely aware in the moment it's the point of let, letting go of the condition if you're always getting caught in your thinking process or your emotions or opinions and views then you're you're bound into the time element the realm of birth and death the suffering uh, that we experience through binding ourselves to changing conditions changing phenomena we want, maybe we would like to have permanent happiness and permanent security from the conditioned realm. Uh, and so it's a kind of hopeless wish because that's not the way it is. Conditioned phenomena can only change. As we can see now in the, in the kind of uh, uh, world problems with the economy. You know, somebody gave me a Newsweek magazine as a cover they, with the, with the figure, the dollar sign, and then it had 
four and then twelve zeros after it. What is that? Four trillion dollars <laughs> is what is needed to, to, to get out of this economy crash. <laughs> what, can you imagine four trillion dollars and where, where we might find such a thing? Or is this, <laughs> is this possible or is this another human creation of the mind? You know, trillion is, uh, you know, billion is more than I can manage. A million now seems pretty like nothing. They talk in billions and trillions. But this, these are words, thoughts, concepts. And yet these do affect us. You know, economy crash, credit crunch, or uh, what was seemed safe, or this idea of progress and development. We'll all become richer and healthier and happier as we have more money and we get what we want and, the de and our economies will develop into global economy where we'll be rid of poverty and on and on like this is the, uh, and create a society, a perfect society where everything is ideal or the way it should be. But the Buddhist uh, Buddha pointed to the way it is, the changingness, the arising and ceasing, the beginning and ending. If something is progressing, it can't progress forever and ever. Progress reaches a peak and then it goes the other direction, degenerates. So may, maybe we're at a peak, you know, where, or maybe we're over the peak now, where the, the whole illusion of market, free market, capitalism and so forth has, is now uh, on the other side. It's, it's degenerating, falling apart. Now this is a natural, this is the way things are, this is natural. You know, now we're trying to blame Gordon Brown for it or, th you know, thinking that who can we blame? George Bush. Uh, we can I like to blame everything on George Bush, personally. But that's just an opinion. I mean, this is, uh, this is just the way things are. And for a Buddhist then, Buddhist meditator, we're, we're, not, <clears throat> we're not, not trying to blame anybody or think that it should have been otherwise. We can, we can learn from it. But the main thing to learn, really, is the way it is, to see it in terms of Dhamma. Now that seeing then is through awareness, mindfulness, Buddha, Bhutto, the word Buddha itself means awakened consciousness in a human form. So you had the, the uh, Gautama, the Buddha, ancient India 2,551 years ago, the, the kind of prophet, the sage, the enlightened one that, that started this tradition that we're, we're, we're carrying on within this traditional teaching, the Four Noble Truths uh, and, and the Sangha life, monastic life. So that's, but that's also time bound. But it, this, this uh, tradition then kind of has, a, has an ability to carry the teaching through the various uh, uh, arisings and cessations of kingdoms, of political systems, economic economy, uh, flourishing economies and crashing ones and empires and all the rest because we're still, you know, pretty much within the same uh, traditional style. The form hasn't, you know, has managed to survive through all the other changing conditions based on, you know, particular cultural attitudes and situations through tr tribalism, kingdoms, empires, colonial systems, uh, and developments and uh, uh, 
flourishing of civilization and it's falling apart and degenerating. So see, you know, that this is a time where this particular way of looking is, is very much uh, sought after because it, it allows us to uh, learn from the way things are rather than spend our lives trying to create, uh, I, uh, you know, through idealism, the perfect relationship, the perfect society, the perfect system. It doesn't prevent us to, for, in, you know, in developing or improving, but that's not our main purpose. We're not here to, to try to, you know, to, to, to create perfect conditions, but we can certainly, you know, do the best we can with the conditions we find ourselves with. So the human bodies that we have, you know, whatever state your body is in, whatever age it might be, or its health, or whatever, that's not really a problem in terms of awakened attention, of re uh, refuge in Buddha Dhamma Sangha. So being physically disabled, or blind, or deaf, or deformed, or sick, or short, or tall, or whatever, it's not, these aren't. You know, these are not problems in themselves. Unless we want them to be otherwise. So the Buddha emphasized in the First Noble Truth of Dukkha, this suffering, wanting something we don't have is suffering, isn't it? Wanting something, when I want something I don't have, and I and I'm not awake. I'm not aware of that. I'm caught in my desire to get something that I don't have. It's like this. Now, through through meditation, I've, you know, I've been able to develop an awareness around wanting something I don't have. So, after all these years in monastic life. You know, they can still be aware, they still want things I don't have, but there's an awareness of it. Where before, before I meditated, I, I, I was just caught into it. Resenting the fact that maybe I couldn't get what I wanted, or striving desperately to get something that I don't have. And when I don't get what I want, then I'm disappointed, angry, upset, resentful. So not getting what I want and wanting what I don't have and not wanting what I have and all this, this is, these are to be recognized as attachments to conditions. This dukkha then arises through this heedless blind attachment to the changing conditions of the body, of the emotions, of uh, the thoughts, Memories. You see, so that notice that they, they it's not trying to, to, to create anything, you know, like a perfect system, but to use the conditions we find ourselves in for awareness. So then the the um, recognition that each one of us is we, we talk in this way of working through our karma, one's karma. Now that can sound very personal, and in some ways it's quite deluding to talk like that, but also has a point that, that each one of us is, has different habits, different ways of thinking, different conditions to deal with. You know, physically, culturally, socially, identities with with race, with gender, with age, with the generation you're born into, with culture. All these are, you know, are different. We don't have, nobody ha has all the same conditions. But that which is aware of the conditions, that's the same. That's the point of intersection between the timeless and time. So mindfulness then 
is the only way that an individual human being can transcend the condition, not, not deny it or reject it, but through that point of intersection we can discern the timeless from the time. So this is what sati sampachanya satipanya is about. Discernment, knowing the time bound is this way. Attachment to the time, to conditioned phenomena out of heedlessness, out of not understanding, having no insight, no realization of the timeless, then we are caught, we're kind of trapped into the time-bound conditions, the habits we have. Have you noticed how, you know, we, we, you know, as you get, you become increasingly aware of just the way your thinking process works, your emotional habits, uh, and you, you can get so caught, so stuck into a cycle of thinking, of, of uh, obsessions with memories or feelings or emotions. Many of you, especially the Sangha, monastic Sangha, who've uh, gone on retreat, silent retreats for any length of time. You know, how long can you stay still in a kuti in the hammer wood? You know, in complete bliss without some obsession taking you over. You know, so some of the obsessions are, can be, you know, quite, others are very boring. You know, so I found myself uh, many times, you know, just sitting in a, in a forest, you know, being alone and then, you know, g feeling some peace and then suddenly the mind will go become obsessed with something. And uh, then the tendency to, to resist the obsession, you know, or try to, or to get caught into the obsession and, and be, pull, you know, or the desire to get rid of the obsession. So wanting to, to, to destroy the obsessive thinking process or to, to get caught into it, just go around and around, wake up in the morning, blah, 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 in the afternoon, evening, wherever you go, this obsession uh, takes you over and then you resent it, and do anything to get rid of it, sleep a lot, or, or you know, distract yourself in some way to get, get out of it. So this is where the mindfulness is, is the only way we can really have perspective on obsessive thoughts, emotional habits, cares, worries uh, that are com common to the human condition. Human beings are thinking creatures. I always, uh, you know, even the word man in English, M-A-N, probably chases back to Sanskrit, mano, thinking, a thinking, a human, a thinking being. So, we're thinking beings. So we do suffer a lot, may, you know, where if you don't think, you know, just think, just think, or just, you know, of not thinking, not having a self, not having to, not having any worries at all. We'd like to maybe only have positive thoughts about love and kindness and happiness and goodness and beauty and truth. And we inspire ourselves with these marvelous kind of concepts. But also, there's the other side, the, the loss, the, the uh, resentment, the unfairness, the injustice, the degeneration, the rotting of corpses, the uh, decay, and on and on like this, this is the side of life we don't like to think about. How many of you like to, to go and watch uh, corpses decay? Or things like this, we you know, there's monks in uh, Thailand, we, 
we often we encourage to do this as Buddhist samanas to observe uh, the the process of decay of animals or uh, it's it's difficult to watch a human being human body decay but sometimes I've seen decaying human bodies and of course it's repulsive and because it stinks it smells bad it's putrid that your one is repelled and turned away from it and but there's an awareness of that repulsion of not wanting uh, an unpleasant odor of a, a decaying putrid corpse is ugly and smells bad and it's repulsive and we don't want it, don't like it. But there's an awareness of this. So the whole aim of a super gamatan or awareness of the unbeautiful in uh, monastic meditation is to bring attention to the very, you know, because this is natural condition, isn't it? Decay, human bodies decaying, animals, corpses decaying, the decaying of leaves. Uh, this, is, this is just the natural flow of life. And we can see here in England, you know, the, the changing of the seasons is so obvious. In the spring, t now everything is, is old now, isn't it? There's no leaves on the trees, no flowers. The leaves are, that have fallen off and are decaying, decaying leaves. And, it, and long nights and short days. And uh, it's cold. And so these tend to be, bring up negative mental states. Or as as I've found living in, in northern uh, European climate, actually it's quite peaceful if you don't uh, create a, an aversion to it. And that, uh, I began to notice the, the winters, having lived uh, so many years in uh, hot countries like Thailand, Malaysia, Where you know you don't the changing of the seasons isn't so so marked so obvious, and then here where uh, you have so many deciduous forests, trees that not like evergreen trees, so much uh, evergreen or fir trees, but trees that lose all their foliage every year. So you you look out on the, the field and you see all these branches from oak trees and poplar trees and so forth. And I remember when I first uh, you know, noticed this, I thought, that's quite ugly, trees without, without leaves. I don't like trees without leaves. Trees should have leaves on them. And being aware of that was an opinion out of conditioning because, you know, I, even in uh, where I'm from, in Washington State, Northwest, it was, uh, you had a lot of uh, evergreen trees. So even in the winter time, you still had this sense of lush foliage. But <clears throat> here, if you notice, it's all, it's uh, deciduous trees, barren branches. And as you stop reacting with aversion or criticism of it, you begin to see the beauty of it of bleakness, of coldness, of grayness, of long nights and short days. And uh, you're changing from just reacting to being averse, critical, <clears throat> comparing it with another place where everything is an eternal spring, beautiful flowers, perfect temperature, is an ideal. Two, just being with the way it is, whatever way it is, because some, sometimes it's really quite uh, unpleasant. You know, cold, bleak, chilly, winter, wet days. It's not physically pleasant experience for us. And it isn't, you know, it's not something that brings 
joy to the heart. But as we stop, as we begin to take our refuge in awareness of it, we don't create the suffering by wanting it to be otherwise. So then our ability to learn from decaying corpses, uh, things going wrong, crashing economies, credit crunches, loss of the loved, uh, failures and disappointments, uh, and all the rest of it is part of a human experience. We, we, d we don't create the suffering around it because we are in that we have established a confident stability within that point of intersection between the timeless and time. So this is what human, what the Buddha was pointing to is being liberated. <clears throat> because even in the time of the Buddha, he, did, he got old. After he was fully enlightened, his body got old and he had pain and all the rest, just like anyone, anyone else. He didn't escape old age, sickness and death. When you read the, the suttas, you know, he had to deal with so many, you know, being blamed for things he didn't do, being a jealous cousin, people trying to kill him, and all kinds of terrible things happened to the Buddha after his enlightenment. So it is, it's, not, it's not like one is getting out of one's karma. You know, so you, you become enlightened and then you just live in a state of perpetual bliss and your body just, uh, you know, gets younger and more beautiful as we would maybe ideal, would like that as an idea. And you can kind of transmute it into radiant light and would be some kind of legend or fairy tale. But it's more, you know, in terms of Dhamma, you, we, we have this, this now this, this refuge in the timeless, the deathless. So our relationship to the time-bound and the death-bound condition is no longer liking or disliking it. But knowing it is like this. And this is a perfection of a human human lifetime. That in this human state that we're in, with all its um, pain and and suffering that we experience, is this ability that the Buddha pointed to to realize, to learn, to see and discern. The time bound is this, it's my thoughts, it's my feelings, it's my memories, it's my body, it's uh, pleasure and pain, birth and death, meeting and parting, success and failure, praise and blame. So when you recognize this, then you're not frightened anymore. Because what does fear come from? But it's about, you know, it's a kind of even primordial emotion. Fear, is a, this is a fear realm we're, we're living in. Notice the animal realm. It's, uh, it's the squirrels, the Amaravati. You know, the rats and the mice and the birds. It's, a, it's about survival and fear because we are in these very vulnerable forms, the animal kingdom, the human realm, which is vulnerable and changing. It's, it's sensitive. So we, we experience sensitivity, uh, which can, does not mean pleasure particularly. It means both pleasure and pain. And so on the, on the fear level, the fear, uh, we live, we worry, we're frightened, we, we're anxious about life, because even when, when, we're, when the economy is, is uh, doing well, and we're healthy and young and beautiful, 
we know it's not going to stay this way. You know, I'm, I, everything's fine right now, it just couldn't be better, but you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. And uh, therefore, anything is possible in the future. The time bound, isn't it? Loss, we all have to experience loss of the loved. And as we live a lifetime, we see that our parents get old, senile, die. Loss of friends, loss of all kinds of things that, that we love <coughs> is a part of human experience. But we're seeing it now from discernment rather than from personal desire, personal obsessions, personal ideals. Or through fear. Because even in an affluent society, when, when the economy was burgeoning here in Britain, people were still, still worried just as much. Because th the future is the unknown, and, th and that means anything could happen. What if I get cancer? What if I lose my health? What if uh, I lose everything that I depend on? You know, this is a possibility that we all dread losing what we like, what we love, what we depend on. The security of an economy or a political system. Because all these are conditions that are subject to change. You cannot find permanency in any political system, economic system, culture, religious convention. In another person, you can't find security through finding the right person because that person is working out their karma which might go in a very different way than yours. You know, how can we force the conditioned realm to do what we want? And that of course is like megalomania, isn't it? It's madness when we try to control the conditioned realm to create an illusory idea that, that I'm a kind of God that can force everything, control everything, and will everything to be what I want. That's madness. But the, uh, uh, the Buddhist attitude of awakened attention to Dhamma, to the way it is. Now as you pursue this and, and, and develop, cultivate awareness, it's a natural state, it's not about me uh, as some great meditator or me because I've been a monk for so long that I'm, you know, I've been able to develop and, and uh, you know, in a very good meditation practice. That, that's how it, you might project onto me that I'm somebody who's developed and cultivated a high state of meditation. What happens is, is more like you're letting go of attachment. It's not, I can't claim it as a, a, on a personal level. You just see all that is personal is condition, personality, my desires, my cultural prejudices, my views and opinions, there are conditions. So it's not about me as a person attaining, it's about letting, seeing through the illusion of me and attainment. To, through letting go, through non-attachment, then we, the, the ability to discern from that point of intersection with the timeless, with time. Because this is, we're, you know, we still have to live, a li uh, live out our lifetime in this form, the human form that you have, which is a time-bound condition. So it, is, it gets old and gets illnesses and will die. 
So the time, the point of intersection of the timeless with time is the mindfulness then. So then it, that is a natural, it's not a created kind of samadhi state where you, you, you control your mind and, and by rejecting everything else. It's, uh, it's the opposite, it's opening to, to embrace everything at this moment, to allow everything to be what it is. You're no, no longer trying to control and deny or get rid of anything, whether it's pleasure, pain, noise, confusion, silence, heat or cold, whatever. It all, all that you're experiencing now is the way it is. That awareness of the way it is then is, is the point of intersection. And so then the discerning, as you trust that more, recognize it and appreciate that, then the timeless is reality, is real. The deathless, the timeless, the unborn, uncreated, this is the real. And as you affirm that and discern it and appreciate it more and more, then that reality, that's real. And so you, you recognize, realize the deathless. Not as a person. It can't, it, it's, it's not that if you claim it as some kind of personal attainment. That kind of thinking doesn't work anymore. It doesn't make sense to, to claim it as some kind of personal achievement. Because it's, uh, it's letting go of the personal to what is real, what is true, rather than live in the illusory world of the conditions of personality, of emotions, habits, thoughts, identity with the body. So the deathless is not some kind of abstract metaphysical concept. The deathless, the timeless, the unborn, uncreated, the non-self, nibbana. These are not kind of just kind of super duper metaphysical abstract terms. It's reality. Because the discerning ability then is, is discerning, knowing the deathless is this, real, this here and now, real. And in this reality, then, they, then the conditions arise and cease according to their nature. The body is the way it is, the seasons change, the winter solstice, uh, the days of the week, the, the gain and loss, the economy is flourishing and crashing, praise, blame, success and failure in the world, all these, you know, happen to us that we, you know, are aware of it, but our refuge is no longer in, in the uncertain, the unstable, the, the changing conditions that, well, if, we, if that's what we hold to and identify with, we are terribly disappointed with life because we've all got to lose everything at the end you know, when your body dies, all that is mine, beloved and pleasing, will become otherwise, will become separated from me. We reflect on that as monastics. We say, all that is mine, beloved and pleasing, will be mine and pleasing forever and ever. <laughs> <laughs> it will uh, lead to terrible disillusionment. Uh, you might long for that, but that's not the way things are. But death and old age, and th th these are not, this is not suffering. This is not the first noble truth about, unless we identify with, uh, with these, with, you know, we don't want our bodies to die 
and we don't want them to be sick or get old or suffer in any way. That's the suffering. The natural aging process of the body, whatever way it goes, we can bear that. Even the chronic illnesses or, or diseases or disabilities, these are, you know, if we recognize or realize, have this discerning ability, our refuge is in the deathless, in the unconditioned. So our relationship to the conditioned is no longer personal, no longer do we attach to it out of ignorance, but we can bear with it when, even if it changes in ways that are painful or unpleasant. Because that's the way it is. That's what we learn from. So I encourage you to, uh, that this uh, this is a you know if you keep pursuing this this way of reflecting you know you can find for yourself you have to realize this for yourself you know my talking like this is just kind of kind of encourage you to uh, to practice this you know to keep, and learning to trust yourself more to develop and not to to always let yourself, your critical self, uh, you know, believe in your own sa uh, illusions about yourself. Because it's so easy to, for us to be self-critical, to see ourselves through negative uh, perceptions. I'm not good enough, I'm not wise enough, I'm not uh, that. It's so easy to believe all these things uh, or that I, you know, we we limit ourselves by the belief in the in oftentimes our critical perceptions. So that's why I'm encouraging you not to do that. Don't believe anything your your thinking mind tells you about your ability or lack of ability. About your, you know, if you, whatever you think you are, you're not that. If you think you're the best and you're an enlightened Buddha, you're not that. If you think you're hopeless uh, sinner, you're not that either. Whatever you think, or if you think, oh, I'm just an ordinary guy, you know, I'm not bad, I'm not particularly a saint, but I'm okay, that's not what you are either. <laughs> There's no way you'll find yourself by trying to, fi to, to define yourself through any means whatsoever. But whatever you think you are, you can be aware that that is a condition changing. The thought, I am a, a good man, is like this. The thought, I am a bad man, is like this. There's nothing permanent about the thinking. But one can be aware of thinking. You're not a thought. You're not what you think. You're not a concept. You're not a, a personality, a body. You're not a man or a woman, a monk or a nun, or a layperson, or anything. Buddhist. You're not even a Buddhist. Then, then, what am I then? <laughs> and then, if I say, "Well, you're really nothing," and then you think, "What a hopeless religion that is!" You know, I'm a child of God, or I'm a <laughs> free, free spirit to, to love, and that you're not that either. So once you let go of conditions good or, or bad, then you realize what liberation is. It's natural, it's peaceful, and it allows us to bear with the karma that we have to experience in the forms that we're living in. And as it's not like praying to God to save me from all pain and suffering, but if pain and and loss, and that part of this, what I have to experience is till the death of this body, and that's fine. It's not, you know, I can bear that. I'm, 
I learn from that, from the way things happen, the arising and ceasings of condition. So I'll be leaving for Thailand on Monday for six weeks and return here on the 3rd of February. And I will uh, visit, I'll just stay in Ubon most of the time uh, and uh, attend the memorial service for Lung Po Cha at Wat Pa Nong Pa Pong, Wat Nana Chat, and uh, so forth. If you go to Chiang Mai, give my annual retreats in Chiang Mai. And here you can, uh, you have a winter's retreat starts in the uh, uh, second week of January. So see, this is a really, you know, something to, you know, it's a wonderful opportunity. I have three months for the, for the ordained Sangha, you know, just to, to devote yourself to this because the lay, Lay community, they come forth in a very generous way too. Uh, you know, kind of do the, the work in the monastery so that the monastic Sangha can, can cultivate. Uh, because it's through uh, this, this opportunity to devote yourself just to this, to awareness, to where it's, you know, you get beyond doubt and, and delusion. You see that. The f the even the subtle attachments, subtle habits begin to you notice. And that which notices and is awake and aware, that is your refuge. That's Buddha Dhamma Sangha, the point of intersection between the timeless and time, and the ability within the human form to discern the timeless to awaken to the real. The reality is yourself, really, not your body, not your sense of, not as a person, but it is the nature, it's Dhamma. This is, you know, putting it in absurd English terminologies, that's what you really are. <coughs> but that doesn't make sense in the long run. You have to let go of even the, I am the deathless, the ultimate truth, can be another uh, delusion we create. Now that's why it's not a matter of trying to find out who you are or what you are. It's discerning that what you're not is the condition, conditions that you tend to think you are or believe you are. So you don't have to find yourself, you just have, you know, you have to let go of the illusions you have about yourself. And that would be the liberation, that would be Nibbana, that would be freedom from delusion within the, the, this human form. So I offer this for your reflection.